Y'all, I am sorry about this. Okay, now, oh, I see what I did. Okay, y'all, that was my mistake. I am so sorry. Here we are 12 minutes into the presentation and I forgot to click this one little thing to add my sound to the stream. So I apologize. Thank you for hanging on so long. Right now, y'all are the only two on here. <laughs> Everybody else gave up. So, um, oh wait, Rena's here. All right, Rena's here. Good to see ya. Um, okay, and I think uh, we were gonna have, I don't always see everybody that's joining us, um, but we should, um, right now there is, all right, we're live on St. Mark's and Wildwood and several other Facebook pages. So, okay, we got a lot to go over today. So um, we are four minutes behind um, and we're gonna run into it guys. So, um, I've, I've gone ahead and gotten the slideshow started. Um, I am doing this in, I'm doing this in my office since, um, well, not that you guys care because you're all on the internet, but uh, I'm doing this in my office since we don't have anybody in person today. So we're going to run through this and I'm using a slightly different setup since I'm only doing this uh, here in my office. So that's some of why I think um, I didn't quite have things set up because I'm not used to doing it this way. But I think I've got it now, so we should be able to rock and roll. All right, let's um, begin, and uh, we're going to move to the next slide. So welcome, everyone, and we're going to start uh, with prayer. So if you could please pray with me as we start. Awesome and living God, we are yours. We pray that this time of sharing and learning moves us to more faithful obedience to your call for justice and mercy. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, we've got some key verses. Um, these are um, kind of some central themes that we are continuing, but are, are especially emphasized in this part of Revelation. Uh, and here it is. So Revelation 12, 11 to 12a. Now, when there's an A on the verse, that just means it's the first part of that verse. So, but they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. And the him, by the way, that they conquered is um, the dragon. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and those that dwell in them. The next verse is Revelation uh, 14, 13. It's one of our Beatitudes from Revelation. And it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who from now on die in the Lord. Yes, says the spirit, they will rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into the, um, the video. We're going to just dive right into it here. And um, I am going to have to switch screens here. I only have one screen that I'm running. I usually have two. I've got the TV and the fellowship hall and my laptop. Today I only have one, so it's going to be a little more clunky. It's not going to look near as fancy schmancy. But here we go. In many ways, Revelation is the story of God's new exodus, God's new deliverance of his people from an oppressive context and ushering them into a new promised land where they will be fully free to worship God as they ought and to enjoy the unclouded presence and favor of God and God's Messiah. In the previous lesson, we witnessed the sealing of the people of God for their protection from the punishments that God would send forth upon the land. In this lesson, those punishments began in earnest. 
God's goal in these opening stages is to motivate repentance, even as the plagues visited upon Egypt were meant to provoke a change of heart. Repentance, however, is not the consequence of these visitations of judgment. John sees the inhabitants of the earth rather continuing to huddle about their false centers, their idols, and to pursue their destructive paths. It is this backdrop that makes the narrative of chapter 11, the career of the two witnesses, so striking. If there is to be any hope for those who gather to worship around false centers and live heedless of the claims of the living God and his Messiah, it will come through the witness of God's people. John particularly focuses on the power of witness unto death, in the aftermath of which there is, eventually, repentance and conversion. This narrative may not speak so closely to those of us in churches in North America, but it remains a powerful incentive to hope and faithfulness for our sisters and brothers in nations that restrict religious liberty, sometimes quite brutally. John's interest throughout Revelation in energizing and clarifying the witness of his congregations raises the questions for us as well. How are you personally, and how is your congregation participating in God's commission to the church to bear witness to God, calling all to honor God and God's claims upon their lives? To what extent do you experience God's empowerment for emboldened witness and possess the willingness to be a spokesperson for God's summons to all nations? In Revelation chapters 12 and 13, John begins his frontal assault on Roman imperialism. He will condemn Roman rule for its violence, both against formerly sovereign countries and all the more against dissenters like most Jews and Christians. He will condemn its economic exploitation of the world it has conquered, catering to the cravings of its elites at the expense of the many. In these chapters, he will particularly condemn its idolatrous legitimation of its own power, especially as this comes to expression in the worship of the goddess Roma and of its emperors as divine beings. It may be difficult for us to imagine the degree to which civic identity, civic pride, and even a sense of civic well-being was bound up with the imperial cult in the cities where John's congregations were located. Every one of these cities had a number of sacred sites dedicated to Rome and to one or more emperors. To be seen as loyal and grateful clients of the emperors was to be assured of imperial favor in time of need. To support the rule of Rome and her emperors was to assure the peace and stability that the provinces needed in order for their elites to prosper. The importance of the imperial cult for these cities is clearly written in stone, as it were. Pergamum had been honored as a temple warden city of the imperial cult for its temple to Augustus and Rome since 29 BC. Smyrna also received this title in AD 26 for its temple to Tiberius. It would not be until A.D. 89 that Ephesus would win this title for itself as well, for its temple to Domitian. Once it did, the city fathers noted the fact in almost every civic inscription, henceforth describing themselves as the council and people of the temple warden city of the Ephesians. Pergamum, however, insisted on its greater status. Their inscribed decrees now began with the council and people of the first to be named temple warden city of the Pergamenes. They lost no time, moreover, in securing a second award of temple warden for their temple to Trajan, built within two decades of Ephesus temple, becoming the council and people of the twice named temple warden city of the Pergamenes. Not to be outdone, 
Ephesus won the bid to build and house the provincial cult of Trajan's successor, Hadrian, also now sporting the title twice-named Temple Warden. Pergamum's response? They began referring to themselves in inscriptions as the council and people of the first to be twice-named Temple Warden city of the Pergamines. The story may strike us as a little ridiculous until we reflect upon the connection between civic pride and sports teams for us. But it gives us a window into the importance of the imperial cult for these cities. It gives us some sense of what it would mean, therefore, for citizens of Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum to watch their neighbors cease to support emperor worship because they have joined a cult whose leaders were quite vocal in pronouncing every god but their own to be a false god a hollow sham. At the close of this week's section, John presented us with another diptych, another two-paneled tableau to consider. Either find ourselves in the throngs gathered at the shrines of human empires to maintain their friendship and enjoy their gifts, or find ourselves standing boldly beside the Lamb, following him wheresoever he goes. Where do we find ourselves in this set of alternatives? Are we too intent on enjoying our slice of the American pie, for example, to give God and God's Christ the full obedience and bold testimony that is their due as our creator and redeemer? Granted that we do not live in the midst of explicit idolatry, as do many of our sisters and brothers across the globe, are we embracing and living out to Nicolaitan a gospel in our attempt to have the best of both worlds? The prophet John would have us engage in prayerful self-examination and realignment of this kind, rather than continue to play the game of pin the tail on the Antichrist. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I thought that little story about the uh, um, the two different cities fighting over temple status was pretty funny, and I think it uh, gives you an idea for the world that John is writing into here. Um, and yes, if you read the passages for this week, um, this is the week where we talk about the Antichrist, and this is kind of the one where everybody wants to talk about the Antichrist and know what that number means and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in reality, um, that might not be the most important thing. So let's go back to our slideshow. Um, and I will apologize again. Um, I cannot see your comments if you do make them unless I switch screens since I'm working off of one screen here. So um, I'm just going to go through the slideshow today and um, go in through uh, just kind of give the presentation and then I will check back in when it's question time to see what any of the questions are. So as we're going through, if you do have questions, feel free to ask them and um, I will, as I'm rolling back, uh, get to them. So these key questions are uh, some things that um, you heard Dr. De Silva bring up and it's also uh, some, some general questions uh, that our study guide asks us to consider. So, um, so first of all, what is the importance of Christian witness in our own time? Uh, how do Christians bear witness to God and Jesus's Lordship today? Of course, it looks a little different. You know, we don't have temples to our president. Um, we don't have places to specifically worship um, other gods. And, the, you know, we, we don't have those things. But we do have things that are probably pretty analogous to this even today. Um, but even without those, you know, how Christians bear witness to God and Jesus's lordship today. And then this is going to have a personal question. How are you participating in God's commission to the church to bear witness 
to Christ. So those are some things to uh, consider uh, as we're going through. There are more sheets of questions too. So the next question, what sites in our own society might be considered shrines of human empires, even though we do not formally worship gods there? Um, you know, what are other sites of worship, um, whether they're civic or recreational? Um, I can tell you from my own personal experience, uh, I went to college at the University of Alabama, and my roommate actually, for his religion class, wrote a uh, a whole paper, and, and uh, it was kind of a sort of like a end of grad, like a, a bachelor thesis on um, Alabama football as a religion. Uh, if you don't know, if you don't follow college football, the University of Alabama is um, kind of like one of the high holy sites, or, or the, the team is one of those legendary teams uh, with legendary coaches and historic wins and, and runs of championships. Uh, and our, our stadium there at the University of Alabama, Bryant-Denny Stadium, especially here in recent years, as we have had a coach that is winning a whole lot of championships and winning a whole lot of games, uh, the stadium and the grounds around the stadium have been changed to be more um, extravagant and more celebratory of Alabama football. There are statues now and there are, you know, um, tailgate areas that are kind of around what you would consider probably holy sites. Um, and and my, my roommate, this was, a lot of these things have been built since I graduated there in 2003. But, um, you know, my roommate, as he was writing his paper, I remember we talked some about what he was doing. And it was just fascinating how, you know, in a lot of ways, Alabama football, depending, of course, on how deep you get into it, Alabama football can be a religion. There is, you know, a, a, a um, celebratory Eucharist. There are rites of passage. There are... Um, you know, sacred things that you do as a member of that religion. Uh, and, you know, you have to sometimes um, ask yourself, you know, hey, am I following, am I um, giving myself to this more than I'm giving myself to Jesus? And I will tell you that, and, and it goes here in Florida too, you know, on, um, you know, after a, a Gator home game, uh, you know, there's a lot fewer people in church, even here. <laughs> um, there were probably not counting the, uh, you know, counting the kids. I think we might have had 40 people in in-person worship today. Uh, I'm not saying that that was directly because there was a Gator home game that was kind of crazy. Um, but, you know, I have noticed that that is a pattern. So, um, you know, you might consider the swamp or Bryant-Denny Stadium to be a shrine of human empire. Uh, you might consider um, Disney or Universal to be shrines of human empires you know, because people do turn those into religions. Uh, you might consider uh, Mount Rushmore to be a shrine of human empire. It, of course, depends on how deep you go into it. You know, you may not, uh, but there are, th these are things we always need to be asking ourselves, you know, is, Am I going to this shrine over going to um, the shrine that I claim to follow as a Christian? The shrine would be church. So that is a good question for us to ask. And it's brought up specifically with, with what's happening in chapters 8 through 14. Uh, and a quick aside, because I know, um, I know that this is about to happen here. I hear um, we are having our youth praise band practice in a few minutes. And so... If you hear some background noise, that's what it is. Um, but just, you know, bear with it. I don't think it's going to be that loud, uh, but this is just kind of where we are today. So the next question, there's a lot of key questions, right? Uh, what would it look like today to witness to the sole lordship of God and Christ in our society? Um, how might we approach public sites or centers of civic pride differently if we side with those who worship the Lamb? Right. So those are some things to think about. I will let you write those down if you need to, just so we can um, uh, 
Okay. So we get to the seven trumpets. We've had seven seals. We had those last week. Um, seven seals that were opened in that scroll of judgment. Now we have seven trumpets. So um, starting on page 81 of our books, as we read, it says uh, the judgments that follow each of these first four trumpets are elemental forces of nature, which are directed against the cosmos and which affect humanity indirectly. The last three trumpets call forth, call forth, sorry, I spelled that wrong, demonic forces falling directly on humanity. So that's kind of the pattern that is going on here. So here we have the first trumpets. So since we are uh, about halfway through, I'm going to go through these trumpets kind of quick. I, I know I don't have to go through all this, but I think maybe seeing it separated like this will help us kind of uh, track the action in this uh, in this. Uh, part of the story, part of the revelation. So the uh, first trumpet, that's why you see the little number one over there. This is a numbered list. Uh, the first angel blew his trumpet. There was hail and fire mixed with blood, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So that's the first one. Second angel blows his trumpet. Something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Third angel blows his trumpet. A great star falls from heaven, uh, blazing like a torch. And it falls on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Uh, the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Many died from the waters because it was made bitter. Fourth trumpet, a uh, third of the sun was struck, third of the moon, third of the stars, so that a third of their light was darkened, a third of the day was kept from shining, and likewise the night. And now, after the four trumpets, remember, this is just like last week, there's a pattern of four as a unit, and then there's an interlude, and then the next two. So this interlude is uh, this... Um, eagle crying with a loud voice as it flies in the sky, uh, or as they would have said, mid-heaven. That's how you would have said it in Greek. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So then we have those other three trumpets. We've got swarms of locusts. This is also, we're told, the first woe. Um, and, and John kind of is emphasizing specific things within these lists of, of um, climatic events uh, as woes. So these swarms of locusts, uh, and he describes them in very, very otherworldly terms, um, but that's the first woe, and they come out of the pit. Now these locusts, it's interesting enough, uh, don't attack crops, which is what locusts would normally do. They're, they're swarming all over the earth, John tells us. Uh, they, um, they're calling the name of, their, um, of, of, of the destroyer, and they, they attack people, though. They don't attack crops. They leave the grass alone, even though we're told that the green grass was burned up. Now there's green grass again, and the locusts don't touch that. Uh, but they do uh, attack people. And then number six, John continues uh, building on what would have been a great fear of the Parthians. We talked about the Parthians last week. And he, he envisions 200 million demonic cal cavalry crossing the Tigris, crossing the Euphrates River. And um, this would have been kind of the culmination of every Romans fears. Now keep in mind, he, John, as he's doing this, he's, he's trying to show that he's trying to show Rome for the um, sham that it is. You know, Rome talks about, you know, we brought order to the earth. We built all these roads. We've expanded commerce. We have stabilized your lives and made it peaceful again. We have, you know, you, 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 you enjoy being a Roman citizen because of all the great things we give you. And yet it was built on, uh, you know, some very um, more, you know, unethical and um, very sinful foundations. And so this, these, the seals and now the trumpets, what they do is they continue to show that Rome is not God. You know, that, that, that Domitian is not the God that he says he is. 
right? This is God is humbling the Roman Empire and the hierarchy of the Roman Empire so that something new can be built. So th there's another interlude and then there is a final trumpet. So in the interlude, we have the scroll and the two witnesses. Um, we have the second woe on Babylon and Babylon, when you see it here, is Rome. Uh, Babylon is used as an image and um, this is how it's used. So um, these two witnesses that we talk about or that, that we read about are not specifically identified. Uh, and then 11, 15 to 19, we essentially, we, we have the, uh, where Handel gets his lyrics for the Messiah and he shall reign forever. Uh, this is actually the, um, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of, it, of his Christ. This is, this is the hallelujah. This is part of the, this is the seventh trumpet, just like the seventh seal, which is a praise God moment. Um, now there is a seventh trumpet. And I do want to point out in this whole progression that um, John is not, and I may have already said this before, but I want to say it again. John is not telling us a linear story here. This is not, um, John is not, what he's kind of doing is is giving us a presentation and then going back and um, showing us a little vignette on something else. And then he's coming back. So, um, and, and we see here after this seventh trumpet, um, we see kind of the end, right? After the final trumpet, when you, when you read this and you end uh, and you end in chapter 11, you're kind of left with, okay, we're done. Right. And you probably read that in the book. Um, you know, we're left with this um, idea that, okay, well, I, that was fun. Uh, it's over now. Right. And uh, then you start back and you find out it wasn't. So this is not supposed to be a linear story. Um, this is not, you know, how John wants us to read it. Uh, John is giving us vignettes or uh, giving uh, people vignettes into what is happening. And there you have. So then you have more action in chapter 12, right? Wait, it's not over. We have, uh, this is kind of how I felt about the Alabama Florida game last night. Um, and uh, wait, it's not over. Um, so you have this story about the woman and the dragon. So uh, what John is doing there in chapter 12, we have now is he is retelling the birth and the life of Jesus. Uh, you start out, you, you can, if you read it, you know, you can see the parallels, uh, what John is doing here and um, kind of how he's telling it. But, you know, the woman flip um, is, she fleds, she goes, she runs away, escapes into the wilderness, flees. Sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. Flees into the wilderness uh, where she has a place prepared by God. And that, that probably was, you know, John, that's how John is telling us about Egypt. Uh, when Jesus and his family escape into Egypt. And then, uh, or also probably Nazareth, because they come back up into Nazareth. And uh, then war breaks out in heaven. So this is Jesus. So John isn't giving us the story we're used to hearing, because that's not his point here. He's not trying to uh, give us the story from Christmas. He's He's framing this story in a way that makes sense for what he's trying to do with this. So he skips all, he skips over a lot allegorically, and he then gets to the war in heaven and Michael and the angels and the dragon and his angels. And um, then he's, the, the dragon is thrown down in the earth. And um, when you, when you see the word portent, cause it happens in here in revelation a lot, especially in this section that we're going to talk about the dragon and all this stuff, the word portent is like a sign or an ominous sign. Um, and so that's that's how you can see it. It's kind of a, a a vision, a sign, and that's how that's how that word is used. It's not a word we use all that much, um, but it is important here because it's used a lot. So the woman and the dragon are uh, is a retelling of the birth and life of Christ. And um, the way that it, you can see is, you know, in verses seven through ten, seven through nine, um, is the war in heaven when Michael and the dragon, Michael and his angels and the dragon, this is this you know, nasty civil war in heaven. Um, what that is, is that's Jesus's life. And, and John sums it up really quick here, but that's Jesus's life. When the forces were fighting, Jesus was on the earth and the dragon and his, his folks were, 
um, fighting in heaven. Well, that, that war is being paralleled um, on earth as well. And then you have verse 10 through 12. This is Easter. And, and uh, for those of you that were in church, you heard me talk about this. Uh, but this is Easter when the victory happens. So there is Good Friday when the war between evil and good is fought. Evil thinks it, it has won. And then boom. <clears throat> so and then there's a resurrection and there's victory. And then now have come the salvation and power of the kingdom of God. Um, and so we move on from there. So next we have the counterfeit trinity. Uh, now you see this, this pattern of three. Um, you've got, uh, you know, but I want to make sure I, I say this because John is not thinking these thoughts because they haven't been historically thought yet. Um, but John is talking about uh, when, when, he, when, we, when we talk about Trinity, it's a, it's a way for us to describe it. John wasn't necessarily thinking this way. Um, Trinitarian theology. So uh, when we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we almost take it for granted, but that's the Trinity, right? There's the Father, the Son, uh, and the Holy Spirit. And we take all three of these as part of the Godhead. They are all three God, they, but they are all three interdependent, unique to each other, um, but God is in three persons. And so that all of that was not codified and really put into the Christian belief officially until 325. So now that was the Council of Nicaea, and John is writing in the year 90, more or less. So, of course, you know, he, he might be thinking Trinitarian, but they weren't really phrasing things that way. This fracturing of Christianity along these lines really didn't begin to happen until later. People just kind of took it for granted. You know, there's God and there's the Messiah, and then there's this spirit of Christ, this spirit that comes down, and they just kind of took that three-part thing for granted. Uh, we don't really have um, fractures in the Christian faith until later about this idea of God in three persons. So John is not Trinitarian, although he might be unbeknownst to himself. Um, but so the, the, when we use the counterfeit Trinity, don't think of it as the same as the idea of the other Trinity. So enough about that. That's just kind of a historical um, thing. So the um, the next, uh, you know, the, this trinity kind of offers us a way to think about John's theology. So the counterfeit trinity is Satan, the Roman emperors, or also you heard the author call it the imperial cult. So the imperial cult is the worship of the emperors. When you use the word cult, it means a religious system. Uh, we're not talking about a cult like, you know, Heaven's Gate or like that kind of like a weird cult. We're just talking about the religious practice, the cult of, you know, what what is, you know, the cult practice of Christianity, of imperial worship. And so the Roman emperors and their worship system was the second part of that trinity. And then you have the false prophet. All right. So moving on, we have uh, the mark of the beast. And so this uh, is part of our uh, of our reading. It is part of what you see, what people cannot buy or sell. Um, and this is what the mark of the beast is. It is the emperor's mark on the Roman coins. And yes, uh, it does say that there, you know, people are, are sealed on their forehead and on their, um, and that is a common, that description is a common Old Testament way of saying that it would be super obvious, you know, um, as to who was bearing the mark or not. And it was because in your hand, you had these coins. Um, and, you know, no, it was not on the forehead. They didn't have coins embedded in foreheads as far as we know, but it was obvious on who was who. So um, think about it. If you're, if you're a Christian in these days and you are resisting, worshiping the emperor. You're not going to the temple to worship the emperor. You are not, and, and this is specifically in John's day, you know, the emperor Domitian here we're talking about. Um, just think about how you would feel about using coins that are inscribed with this uh, human pretending to be a god uh, that is supposed to be worshiped. 
And so, um, and these coins specifically, you can look at and you can read, if you don't have to read Latin to see, uh, we have around the, the coin on the left, there is, uh, do you, if you see the word kind of starting at 12 o'clock and going over to about three o'clock, it says Domitian. And um, this were coins inscribed with his image. And um, of course, Jesus in the gospels, he says, render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's and render unto God's what is God's. Um, but that was before really emperors were deifying themselves. And so, you know, John, John knows that it's always been kind of in the background that emperors are, are were supposed to be divine and since Augustus, but Domitian really, just like Nero did before him, Domitian really, really juices up the emperor worship. And so that is uh, a large part of why Christians began to see this as not just this background thing that we don't really have to worry about, but all of a sudden now you have to worship. Uh, and it's all the way down to the coins that you use. You have to worship. And so imagine if you're a Christian, what do you do? Um, you, you've got to just barter, right? I mean, you know, you are economically cut out of so much. If, you know, you don't want to have participate in the Roman economic system that's built on deifying the emperor and putting his mark on coins and, and talking about how um, holy and divine he is. And that's what a lot of these coins said. And on the back, on the coin on the right, which was the back of it, uh, you had the goddess Roma, who was a personification of the city of Rome. And so the male god was the emperor and the female god was Roma. And those, the marriage of those two is what made the emperor cult what it was. Uh, and so, you know, the great city and um, the holy emperor. So there we have that. All right, so fun with numbers. Um, you've all been waiting for this, I imagine. What's the, the number of the beast, right? Um, this, you know, or, or the number of the Antichrist. Uh, and so this is, we, we start here uh, in, I'm sorry, I'm still looking for it here. Um, okay, well, going back real quick to the coins, uh, I want to read, um, this is verse, chapter 13, verse 16. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell who does not have the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. And then in verse 18, we've got fun with numbers, the number of the beast. And I would have loved to surprise you with the second bullet point, but let's focus on the first one right now. Um, there are two different numbers of the beast. Um, back up a little bit, talk about biblical interpretation and uh, historical um, manuscripts and everything. We have two different numbers for the beast. In some, uh, and you see here in verse 18 of chapter 13, um, the number of a person, its number is 666. Um, this was common. You would, you would um, use uh, this practice of, um, and I forget what the name is now, right off the top of my head, but you would, um, you would talk about it. It talks about it in the book. I won't go over it again, but it's either 666 or 616. And there are two different, manuscripts of Revelation are several different and around the same age. So we don't know which one's the current, more correct copy or which one's the least correct copy that say 666 or 616. Um, and that's because we do not have any original copies of the writings of the Bible. Uh, what we have is copies of copies of copies. And so that is what we translate it. And, and generally speaking, uh, people want to, people, biblical scholars use whatever is the earliest of what they have. And in this case, um, traditionally, Christians have gone with 666, six, 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 even though both of the things are probable. 616 is just as probable. So um, it, it's, and you can see it in your, most of your Bibles should say um, there's a little like footnote 
by the number of the beast that say other ancient authorities or other early manuscripts read 616. So there are two different numbers of the beast. And um, that's just translating the Bible. Uh, there is not a, you know, we can't go back to any original copies here. So you have to translate it with some humility. Um, but we're not trying to, like the author said, we're not trying to pin the tail on the Antichrist here. That's not why we're doing this. Uh, what we really want to know is kind of what the meaning is. Remember that whole phrase we use. This is disciplined imagination. Uh, it doesn't mean what it says. It means what it means. And so uh, this, the, the only person, uh, and, and you're going to want a person of that time because this is who John's writing to, uh, the only person and the most likely person that John is referring to is Nero Caesar. Um, Nero Caesar adds up to 616. Um, but if you were spelling it for a Hebrew audience, it would have been 666 because it would be Neron Caesar. Um, now that's kind of like, um, it, it's the Hebrew Greek spelling. So what I mean by that is um, if you take a word in one language and you try to make it into another language, take a word in a foreign language and try to make it into a native language or a current language that you're using, you have to kind of make it fit. So, um, for instance, in Spanish, uh, there is a new word. Uh, it's more common in Latin Spanish, but um, since I'm I, I do know Spanish a little bit. You know, the word for Spanish for lunch is almuerzo, which is a very awkward word, even for Spanish speakers, although they're more used to saying it. Um, and so a lot of American, U.S. American speaking uh, or U.S. American Spanish speakers have begun saying a word for lunch. That is a transliteration, a Spanish spelling of an English word. They'll say lonche, right? Lonche is lunch, and they've taken that word from English, and they have used it as Spanish, and so they'll be talking about it as, you know, let's go to lunch. So um, that's that's the sort of thing you would use. In some, in some languages, you do add an extra letter. A word in Hebrew never ends in a vowel because real Hebrew doesn't contain vowels, and so you would say Neron Caesar, Neron Caesar. So, and, and there are manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls that contain both of these spellings of Nero Caesar. So what he's trying to say, really, uh, that's a way to make a uh, short story long. But John is uses the word anthropos when he says it is a number of a human or it is a human number. Now, um, anthropos, it could mean it's the number of mankind. And he's just talking about, you know, just short of perfection. It's the number of mankind. But most likely because of the word anthropos that he uses, um, he's saying it's the number of a person. And so, you know, he, he, he kind of specifically says, and anyone in his day could have spelled Neron Caesar or Nero Caesar. And they would have known that he was talking about Domitian because early Christians, um, felt the same way about Domitian that they felt about Nero. And a lot of the uh, kind of things that Christians were saying back then that we know because of their writings was that, you know, when Domitian was reigning, they were saying, oh, no, it's Nero all over again. He started persecuting the church. He was a megalomaniac. He was, a, a an, you know, a, that's, you know, he was an extreme, um, just he was vain, narcissistic, megalomaniac, which I guess is the same thing. He just was, they were like, oh no, here we go again. So, um, and they were pretty much right. And so that he's got, and, and Nero, just so you know, died by suicide. And so the, he became sort of like a bad Elvis, you know, like Elvis, oh no, Elvis is just around the corner. He didn't really die, right? Well, Nero was the same way. And Christians, he became like the boogeyman. Be, you know, Nero really didn't die, and someday he's going to return. And a lot of Christians began to talk about Domitian as Nero resurrected. That, you know, Domitian was just, just like Nero, and he was doing the same things. So um, the question for us is, do we choose the power of the beast or the power of Christ? 
So really quick, I want to quote from page 97 here. Um, so this is, this is the quote, uh, just gives you some fodder here to think. Men and women are so constituted as to worship some absolute power, and if they do not worship the true and real power behind the universe, they will construct a god for themselves and give allegiance to that. In the last analysis, it is always a choice between the power that operates through domination and inflicting suffering, the power of the beast, and the power that operates through redeeming and restoring, even at the cost of accepting suffering. And that is the power of the lamb. So let's go back to those early questions. What would it look like today to witness to the sole lordship of God and Christ in our society? And how might we approach public sites or centers of civic pride differently if we side with those who worship the lamb? You know, uh, this goes back to, you know, a lot of those military sites about, you know, the, the power of domination and inflicting suffering on our enemies. How do we view those if we are, if we're people who believe and, and, and prioritize the power that operates through redeeming and restoring? You know, how do we view those? Probably different than somebody who does not have that point of view. Although, if we're not careful, things can get a little muddled. And we become Christians who uh, glorify uh, a muscular Christ who operates through domination. And that's not a good thing. There's a lot of that lately in Christianity. Okay, so questions. I'm going to go back to my um, screen so I can see your comments. Um, we are uh, right on time. All right, we made up some time. So does anyone have any questions as we go through today? Any questions on what we've read? I know we're drinking from a fire hose again, uh, but did you have any questions? All right. And so this this truly um, John is giving us this kind of great cosmic um, this great vignette into what is the true power that we should anchor our lives in. What is the true power that we should dig ourselves into? Uh, and so that is, of course, the power of the lamb, the slaughtered lamb. And so that carries a very different um, way of using power because it carries a very different power than the power of the world or the power of empire and the power of the beast. Um, Selena, Walk okay, Selena, uh, let me put your comment on here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it really um, probably isn't. I'll say it that way. Uh, with what Revelation is giving them more of the... Um, He's giving his message to the seven churches, uh, and so he's not um, he, he's not doing it for our benefit. But John is giving his vision to us in the sense that John is giving us a show of the the great cataclysmic battle that is always happening between good and evil, between um, God and um, evil, I guess. I, I, I sometimes don't like personifying it as Satan because that's not, um, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, Satan is a personification of evil. So Jesus and the world, Jesus and Satan. So yeah, it, it's not um, the mark of the beast as it's referring to it is he was talking about the coins of the empire and uh, the number of the beast was the Roman emperor. Uh, that's most likely what he's referring to. However, there are lots of rulers that rise up um, and uh, claim the same kind of power that Domitian did. Uh, that they, they claim that absolute power and they, they, um, they desire to be worshiped. They desire to be made into a God. Uh, and those, those rulers are still around today. Um, and they're not just rulers that, you know, uh, are on in some far off land. So, um, 
you know, we as Christians have to look at this, at these historical things back in these days and say, hey, you know, um, this is, uh, you know, this is the kind of power we resist. Um, all right, Sharon, let me put you on here. Aha, you, we're getting into the rapture now. Okay. And then that's, all right, Rena talking about uh, Confederate statues. Okay, well, let's, um, so you have not heard me talk about the rapture yet um, because uh, the rapture does not play into all of this. Um, the rapture is a misreading. It is a very novel concept. Um, only People only started talking about it in, I believe it was the, um, all started, there was a few mentions of it in the Puritan days, uh, and then they went on, really got big in the 19th and 20th century. Um, but in, in Thessalonians, Paul talks about being caught up into the air, and then there's other passages talking about people being, you know, disappearing one day. There's two people in a field, and one's gone. And and later readers of the Bible who did not really understand what that was referring to took that as what we now call the rapture. But historical Christianity and and Christianity for the first 1,800 years, and really even today, most of Christianity does not uh, believe that the rapture is a biblically appropriate way of seeing um, what John and Paul and um, Jesus even are describing. Uh, and so, you know, this idea of poof, everybody's gone um, is not really how the Bible saw it working. It talks about going up into the clouds with Jesus, and that was how you talked about being in the king's presence. Uh, when you went and visited a king, that was, um, you know, you, you were, um, you know, you, you went up in the clouds to go and visit the king. Um, you met him in heaven or in, in the highest, you know, so that was just a different way of talking about it. But, you know, a couple of preachers started talking about that and all of a sudden it's mainstream American Christianity. So the rapture does not play into all of this. Um, and there are, of course, different readings of Revelation. I don't think it matters to your salvation, whether or not you believe the rapture. Uh, but as far as kind of the way I read the Bible and the way that I would teach this, uh, I do not believe uh, that the rapture plays into this. I think it's a misreading of what the Bible says. Um, and um, the recent change of Confederate heroes, right. Um, I think that is a, a really, really good example of, um, you know, and, and I speak as a descendant of slave owners. Um, and, you know, I was never taught to really look at them as anything other than just people who are in my family, who I'm related to, you know, that owned slaves before the Civil War. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you begin to think, wait a second, a lot of, uh, you know, some of my family's wealth or, you know, the wealth that was indirectly carried on to me after four or five generations, that was built on the backs of slave home, you know, slaves um, who didn't get a share in that. And so, um, yeah, that really, you know, that was domination through force. And um, that is something I think we as Christians uh, should reflect on and say, wait a second, you know, that is something we should take a stand against. Uh, and Rena, you have another comment here about uh, building empires on unethical foundations. Um, that is a, you know, that is a good point. Um, and, and another little point that I will add, and I do not have the specific statistic with me, um, but the U.S. has been at war for something like 90% of its existence. Uh, and like I said, I don't have the exact citation of that. Uh, but, you know, you have to really wonder, you know, we as a, as a country, we talk about freedom and we talk about peace and we talk about, um, you know, building a world that's more at peace. And we fought the two world wars to to kind of help the world be at peace. And then what do we turn on over and over again is this idea of war. You know, right after World War II, what happened? We had to go back to war again, we thought. And then after the Korean War ended, we had to go back to Vietnam. We had to go to Vietnam. And then after that was over, we, you know, so, yeah, what are we really building our societal foundations on? And, you know, the idea of a um, national war does affect the Christians that are a part of the country. Um, and so, you know, with our faith, um, 
we I really, you know, how much do we, without even thinking about it, how much do we really buy in to the warmongering that sometimes every human society, the U.S. is not an exception. Um, how much do we as Christians of all stripes, of all nationalities, of all historical episodes, how often do we buy into the rhetoric of war and begin to see it at war as something that we as Christians should glorify? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there is a just war theory in Christianity that talks about, you know, for a righteous cause, um, you know, uh, for a righteous cause, some, you know, sometimes war may be a regretful way to to go about trying to bring some good into it. Think about Hitler. You know, we fought Hitler to so he would stop slaughtering all the Jews. Well, that was a good thing. But when we did that, what was the spirit of us doing it? Why, why were we doing that? And, um, you know, yeah, it, it's a it's a tough thing. And um, Rena, you're you're commenting a lot. Thank you. Uh, Shrines of human empires, uh, the huge cathedrals and churches honor God. Um, you know, that is a that is always a good question. Um, you know. Sometimes those shrines of cathedrals and churches are uh, built to, you know, honor other things in addition to God. Uh, but, you know, I know not to, there's also a different side to the cathedrals, huge churches and everything. Uh, you know, cathedrals specifically, you know, they were built to try to lift your eyes and give you this sense of being in a heavenly place. So that, you know, some of these massive uh, cathedrals in Europe, that is part of what they do. Um, but, you know, large churches, um, there are large churches, I'm sure, that do honor God and do great jobs and great work. And then there are other ones that are all about building themselves bigger and bigger. And that's really what they exist to do, self-perpetuate instead of actually honor God. Um, and some dictatorships do demand worship. You know, you have to mind your P's and Q's and, and honor um, them. And, you know, there aren't um, it has gone out of style a little bit to be worshipped as a leader. Um, there are very few um countries that actually, you know, that the ruler is divine. Um, but there are certain things that people can be forced to do that are directly against their convictions as a Christian. They're directly against their Christian faith and they do them um, and, and they are forced in some sort of way or they are in danger of being forced to do them because they live in a country that doesn't operate by those Christian principles. Um, and, and, you know, there's there's a lot of gray in what we're talking about. There are certain things that are black and white, you know, um, and uh, but there is a whole lot of gray. And I think we have to really watch as Christians and be aware, always be aware um, that the. Um, that that, you know, the world is always in danger, that the human structures of power are always in danger of, of replacing God, of, of wanting to replace God. Um, and, you know, do we worship the slaughtered lamb or do we worship uh, worldly power and domination? Uh, and that is, that's a tough, that, that is always a very, um, uh, a, a very constant line that you have to walk. Uh, because it is not something that is um, always apparent. And, you know, uh, going back a little bit to the, the the U.S. and the treatment of slaves and indigenous people, you know, that, you know, we're here, right? And we can't say, um, all right, we're just going to give all our land back to the Native Americans because we're here and this is our home too now. And, you know, unfortunately, this was what was built for us. And so, but we can ask ourselves, all right, how can we honor the fact that we replaced them or we abused these people, how can we honor them uh, and, and, and in a Christian sort of way? And, you know, we can't all move back to our original countries of origin ancestrally because, um, you know, that, that really wouldn't make sense, right? But, uh, and, and even those countries of origin, even England and France, they are countries because there was another tribe of people that came from somewhere else and displaced the tribe that was already there. And so you always have that. But, you know, I think it offers us humanity a chance to really live with humility uh, because we know that we are living on borrowed land. 
Uh, we are stolen land in a lot of cases. Uh, and we are also living on God's earth. You know, it, it is God's. And so, you know, what has happened in history, we obviously can't change it. But what we can do is live generous lives and peaceful lives and loving lives so that our time here on earth, however we got here, our time here on earth and whatever earth we have inherited is a peaceful and loving and self-sustaining place for all humans to live, period. And so um, that is uh, something. Okay. Yes. All right. Rena, yeah, on page 93 uh, in text, there's a reference to Psalm 2-9, ruling with an iron hand. Yeah, the um, it was easy to see the expectation of the Jewish people for a po physically powerful Messiah. Right, even they had fallen into that, and they were being oppressed. They were being ruled over by the Romans, and oh my gosh, you know, they wanted this Jesus to come in there and kick tail and take names and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, and you can't, you can understand that they would want that, right? That's, that's only human. Um, but yeah, you know, it, that wouldn't have helped anything, would it have? Because they've tried that before. All of us have tried, every society has tried that before. And it doesn't sustain itself. Um, what does sustain itself and bless others is love and God's justice, not the justice we would substitute it for. So, um, Thanks for the yes, Sharon. I appreciate it. Um, and, and also um, going back even further to that, you know, slaves and indigenous people comment. Um, a lot of that was supported by Christianity. Uh, you know, the, the, the way they read the Bible then, uh, well, the way that, a lot, that several folks read the Bible, not John Wesley, but lots of other folks, the way they read the Bible was that, you know, these darker skinned people, these primitive people were cursed. And so they were, you know, that, that white people were created to rule and that these darker skinned, more primitive people were created to be ruled over. And that was just the way God designed it. Um, that they, they read their Bibles and that's what they thought it said um, in, in, a, in a lot of cases. And that's what a lot of denominations taught. That's what a lot of churches taught their pastors to teach. And so it, it just perpetuated itself. And it took a long, long time for people to say, wait a minute, that's not really what it says. And even then, when people realized that wasn't what it says, that took it took even more courage. And a lot of people didn't have this much courage to say, wait, that's not what it says. And I need to do something about it. Um, I need to even for white folks, I need to give up my, some of my privileges so that these people that have been oppressed can have a fuller, more complete life. Um, and that's, you know, that's tough uh, when we have to really see ourselves as um, part of the problem uh, and, and part of see ourselves as the person God is calling uh, to sacrifice so that others can um, so that others can be loved and be accepted. Yeah. So um, we've gotten deep here. Man, all right. Well, thank you all so, so much uh, for being here today. And um, I hope that you've enjoyed this. Thank you all for uh, being a part of this study. I know it has gone a little long, but I uh, do appreciate this. And um, we're going to end with uh, some prayer. Uh, so let, let's go to God and in our time. God of grace and glory, we have explored, shared, learned, and questioned together. Thank you. Help us to take the lessons from this time into our lives so that people can see your love alive in us. Keep us open to your presence and power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, preparation for session five. Um, read chapters nine and ten in Breaking the Code. Uh, those are the next two chapters we're going over. Uh, read Revelation 14, 6 to 18, 24. And uh, also consider an insight you'd like to share from the fourth and fifth Beatitudes of Revelation. Uh, Revelation 19, 9 and 26 are the next two Beatitudes. So um, those kind of help to frame the mindset. Uh, whenever the Bible is talking about blessed is da-da-da-da-da, they're saying 
these are the people that are doing it right. Follow them. They are blessed. So um, when you read that, that's kind of a, a message to pay attention. Um, and thank you uh, so much again for being here and being a part of this. And um, I hope you have a blessed week. Uh, and I will see you guys later.